don't think we've quite connected yet because on my participant screen it hasn't logged in. There we go. There we go. All right, hello to everyone who's coming in of um, attendees. We're going to give it a minute for folks to be able to get tech in order and, and get logged in and then we will get started soon. So just hang tight for a moment. Alrighty. Well, we may have some more people trickling in, but in the interest of starting promptly and uh, honoring our on-time arrivals, I uh, will get started. So good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Katherine Shortliff and I am the Engagement Manager at Fruitlands Museum, a property of the trustees. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and we're thrilled to have you here for this wonderful event as we take a look behind the scenes and dive into the archives of Mirror the Essence Polly Fair Star. I want to first acknowledge that Fruitlands Museum is located on the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Nipmuc and Pawtucket tribal nations, closely related to nearby Massachusetts and Wampanoag tribal nations. We acknowledge the history of settler colonialism and the repeated violations of sovereignty and territory perpetuated by European settlers. I'm not currently on site at Fruitlands and I personally join you today from Pawtucket and Massachusetts land, as I believe Christy does as well. Since 2016, Fruitlands Museum has been part of the trustees, Massachusetts' oldest and largest land conservation and pre preservation organization with 120 properties across the Commonwealth. We are a member supported institution and if you're if you enjoy your experience here today we encourage you to check out more events and opportunities both at Fruitlands and at all of our other special places across the state. I also want to take a moment to thank all of our members who are joining us here today. Uh, we appreciate your support. We have guests joining us from near and far today. Welcome. Uh, if you are local, I encourage you to come visit us on site and check, check out the exhibition in person. Uh, we are currently open weekends only on our grounds and in our art gallery with capacity controls and required advanced ticketing. Uh, in a minute, I will add some links to the chat box where you can find more information about ticketing, our current exhibitions, and additional on-site offerings, including hiking, snowshoeing with snowshoe rentals, sledding and private fire pit rentals, which have been wildly popular and sell out well in advance actually. Um, during our program today, I invite you to use the Q&A box to submit questions. And for our Q&A session um, at the conclusion of the program, feel free to submit them as they come to you and I will keep an eye out for those. And now I'm very happy to introduce my wonderful colleague, Trustees Senior Curator, Christy Jackson. So over to you, Christy. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Well, I'm so excited to be doing this program with you this evening because there's no greater joy for a curator than really diving deep and going into a lot of material uh, that people don't usually get to see. So you're gonna see some of my favorites along the way and um, we'll explore a little bit of Polly and all that she brings um, in her legacy. So just by way of kind of referencing um, and kind of grounding us in what, what we're doing here tonight. Uh, so the Near the Essence exhibit over at Fruitlands is part of a three-year project uh, with generous support from the Polly Thayer Star Charitable Trust. It included working in our archives and processing things that had to do with Polly Thayer Star and Wear River Farm. Here you see the exhibit at Fruitlands Museum, uh, which will be concluding at the end of March. And then the third year, next year, we're going to be going over to Wear River Farm and having an outdoor exhibition there. And what we're going to do tonight, though, is a little bit different than what you're going to see in the exhibit. 
because for every item that gets hung up in the wall in the gallery, there's probably a hundred other pieces that I've looked through uh, to get to that point. And that's what we're gonna look at, all of the little bits and, and things that didn't make into the gallery as we sort of explore this uh, process of exploration of Bali. Also, if you come on site, one of the things that you can do outdoors through March is an exploration trail with these exploration stations. And these are really a wonderful way to engage with nature. They have quotations by Polly. Uh, some of her artworks, you can see them in the natural light as many of them were painted. And then a series of sort of questions and prompts for you to look at the landscape and sort of think about what Polly saw. We also have free journals for anyone to pick up over at the Wayside Inn. And you can take those with you home and look at your backyard if you want um, and enjoy that process as well. Before we get started, I just want to sort of ground us in who Polly was. If you aren't familiar with her, let me introduce you to her. She had a 75 year career, uh, really it's sort of an extraordinary life. Um, she went through very traditional, uh, wonderful training at the Boston um, Museum of Fine Arts School. She was at the Art Students League in New York. She traveled and studied abroad. And in her first solo show, only a few years in painting professionally, she had 17 commissions from her first solo show. That's pretty remarkable um, for any artist and sort of she bound onto the scene um, during that time. So she really is um, sort of a star in my mind. And in addition, she has a, a long legacy, not just as an artist, but someone who gave to uh, the community who really supported um, all sorts of causes. She loved animals. She was a Quaker. She wanted to help those in the community in the arts and nonprofits. And so many of the Boston institutions, if you will, from the trustees to the Boston Athenaeum, to the Nichols House, to the MFA, all of us have had Polly touch us over the years. She has her archives at the Smithsonian Archives for American Art, and we have some archives as well at the Trustees of Reservation. And just to point you uh, towards the charitable trust that continues her legacy and work, the Polly Thayer Star uh, Charitable Trust just launched a brand new website. So you can go there and explore after this talk if you would like. So let's get going. Uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of what you're going to see tonight are pieces that didn't make it into this show. And we're really sort of the, the digging and going deeper into understanding who Polly was as an artist, as a community member, as a student early on. And so we're going to be taking that deep dive into a lot of these materials that haven't been seen before. And there's some themes that we're going to be exploring along the way as well. One of the things that is so clear early on is that Polly was always a student. She may have had early formal training, but it was something she continually went back to. She always had a notebook in her pocket. She was always looking to explore and learn. And she even said, Every since, ever since I could hold a pencil, I was drawing something. And that clearly was the case. This is a little sketchbook in one of her uh, school uh, notebooks when she was in art school always kind of doodling and studying and, and seeing what was around her. And in addition, there's this quality that you see through many of the archive pieces that she really was exploring, not just as an artist, but someone who almost was a scientist, who was an experimenter, who was a naturalist. And I just highlight here a few pieces. One is sort of um, an experiment where she was trying different um, types of gesso and sort of what the different um, canvases would look like with different kind of components layered. There's actually correspondence where she was writing to gesso and paint companies, talking about the chemistry of the paint, uh, really engaging in that sort of scientific process of what she was doing. In addition, there are many different uh, sort of underlined and starred um, lectures and books that she would read and taking notes and learning about perception and light and shading and sort of the science of it all. And so it's really exciting to kind of see that process because she was soaking in along the way all of this that really helped and enhanced her artistic process. One of the things early on when she was going through the, her more formal training, uh, she really wanted to sort of study the form. And here you see two overlapping pieces of sort of a man bending over and then sort of his anatomy underneath. 
she actually was known to go to bullfights to sort of study what was happening in the ring. She even went to surgeries uh, to sort of see what was going on um, and studying the human form. Uh, she actually said, and this is a quote from her, I wanted to get out there into the streets and that had been recommended to me. The most dramatic thing was either on stage or in operations. I remember asking a doctor friend to take me into his operating room. So he tucked me in the corner and I followed and make many drawings of them. So there's this always this interest in sort of studying the human form, studying animal forms, studying natural forms, and really getting into the depth of it. And so there's pages and pages of these of, um, sort of early training um, as she went through her formal education. In addition, she had many mentorships, which was not un uncommon. Um, Well-trained artists would have one-on-one -on -one mentorships with different individuals. And the interesting thing is she continually refers back to these you know, 70 years later, talking about the influences that these mentors had to her artistic process. A few examples of Philip Hale, Polly said, everything was edges. Of Charles Hawthorne, she said that she explored light and darkness and quote, was full of joy and full sunlight. And of Eugene Spicer at the studio, she recalled that he said to her, get out on the streets, get some life into it. So she was always really internalizing what these mentors were, were sort of telling her, showing her, and experimenting and moving on. An example that you see here is from uh, Harry Wicking. And I found this at the archives down at the Smithsonian, and it's a pretty large piece of paper. And if you notice on the right-hand side of the screen on the bottom, she's actually written, again, 70 years later, in pencil um, something. And she said that, that Harry, opened the world of plastic form with a few strokes of his pencil above. So right on the top corner, you can see that he has, in this class, Harry kind of leaned over and showing her sort of how forms could be taken apart. And the fact that she would go back so much later and sort of talk about how important that was, I think really solidifies for me, and I think for many people, how much those early experiences meant to her and that she would kind of always look back. And you see in this quotation in 1995, she said the heavens opened um, during some of these classes. And if we look at an example of sort of what these interactions with other artists, both living and those that had passed um, and sort of the classes that she took, I wanted to share with you one example. And this is actually a portrait of Olivia Chambers that is in the show um, on loan to us. And when uh, Polly painted Olivia in New York in 1933, she wrote her mother and said, I'm thrilled over her. And it happened to be that she was in New York and going over to the Met and studying Goya's portrait scene here. And that was something that she did pretty commonly, that she would go to different museums and really study, go in depth into a piece and really learn all that she could and then translate that to her own artistic process. On the right hand side of the screen, you see sort of a copy that you could just purchase at the museum store of that same uh, portrait. But if you notice, there's lines. She sort of scribed these lines to look at proportion, to look at light and shading, and really kind of taken it apart, almost again like a scientist or a mathematician. One of the things that I love most about this, and this is in the show, is if you flip it over in the lower uh, right corner, you'll see the back. And there's some little um, scribbles of uh, what she was seeing, I'm sure of it, in those gallery settings of other people that are kind of walking by. And I just love this, that she is sort of taking her moment to explore Goya's work and then thinking about how it might translate to this painting she was working on at that moment of Olivia. When Polly talked about Goya in this way, um, this is what she said. For a good colorist, she's talking about Goya, for a good colorist, it is surprising that as he matured, he not only used more and more black, but almost exclusively black, which is seen by most painters as the killer of color. So again, she's really drawing from that experience in her own way. And here you'll see different sketchbooks uh, uh, or different images within the same sketchbook of Olivia that she was trying to play with this idea of black and proportion and how still to bring in sort of that fluid, that sense of life and 
joy, even in black, as Goya had been so successful. Uh, so this really gives us that glimpse of how Polly is internalizing these uh, things that she's seeing and learning around her and then making it her own as well. Well, she definitely experimented. And as I went through the archives, one of the things I loved um, from the Charitable Trust was a folder that said experiments on it. And out popped this wonderful little, very small uh, red uh, beauty. And I loved that through her life, she was always just trying new things out, um, seeing what would work. And in this quotation, you'll see here that she talks about her, her sort of Boston school, as they call it, um, training at that point, that uh, it was a straitjacket in some ways, that it was really important. She always acknowledged that that was the foundation for her uh, sort of training and she took and ran with it, um, but that that could be limiting at times. Um, and that she said that the subject matter of the placid ladies and the pleasant backgrounds was not what I wanted to paint about. Uh, and I think that's really sort of telling that she wanted to push those boundaries. She wanted to explore. She was a very thoughtful and smart woman and wanted to see what else was there to, to be found. In addition to, um, it's fun to see uh, sort of how she even was playful in her own signatures. Uh, on the left, you'll see this wonderful star signature um, in a, a letter, and it was something that in many letters she would write. And then on the right, um, on loan to us um, from one of her wonderful colleagues and, and um, friends, uh, Dorothy, uh, you'll see that she was attempting different ways to sort of sign her work, um, different types of signatures. And so this sense of exploration and playfulness, if you will, continues over even to something as simple as a person's name. Well, Polly was definitely no stranger to exploring the world. Uh, she's talked about her studio and she said, it's where I loved most intensely and where I wanted to live, but she was also keenly aware of sort of the importance of going out and seeing what was beyond. Um, and this portrait looking out of her, of this photograph, looking out at sort of Boston in the winter, you see in many of her sketchbooks that she would paint or draw and um, often with pencil, these wonderful images of what she was seeing outside of her window in Boston. She also talked about living in an old home on uh, Beacon Street. And uh, for those of us that love houses like I do, historic houses as I do, uh, she said that living in a historic house was this way. Living in these old homes is like having a Rolls Royce. Everything's perfectly wonderful, but you can't replace the parts. Um, so for anyone who works with the trustees and works at our historic properties, you sort of know that that um, is a wonderful statement and, and very true. And she really loved the old architecture and sort of looking at the nuances of how the buildings uh, were sort of derived and, and what they came from. And she talked about this looking out her window in the wintertime. She said, during the winter, I often worked in monochromes in my studio overlooking the Charles River, exploring the pristine whiteness the sweep of snowscapes interpreted in various media. With the arrival of spring, I found my mind returning to color with the outside world. So she both loved being inside and kind of looking out, but also went out. She went out to see what was there. Uh, she had again in many mentors along the way, but one of them, uh, Royal Courtesan, uh, who is an art critic. Um, and he also interestingly uh, did the inscription on the Lincoln Memorial. Um, had a correspondence with her. And some of those are in the Smithsonian and some of them are in the New York archive as well. But he would often write her and give her sort of little bits of advice. And she, she clearly um, internalized those. And at times you can see she'll send him uh, announcements of her new art. He would come and see uh, the shows that she was doing. But he said to her, I appeal to you to develop your great gift in an atmosphere fresher and stronger than of your studio. So many of Polly's notebooks that she carried with her, you'll see are of sort of what she was seeing. She traveled near and far. She would have these wonderful notebooks just sort of doing studies of what she saw in that instant. Always being playful, always being uh, thoughtful in her approach and sort of playing with what she was seeing um, and experiencing a little bit differently. And Royal also said to her, the one danger that I sensed in your work at the Academy was that of crystallization in a studio formula, specifically the formula within the Boston group that has been made so popular. They have painted human beings too much as still lives. And this idea again, that Polly was going out and 
trying to observe people in motion. And I think one of the things that I love about her sketchbooks um, and these, these small, wonderful artworks in and of themselves, are they, there's a sense of movement. Um, to me, it, in some ways, many of the figures are not fully formed. They're quickly done. Um, and that movement that's caught there, but a, a moment is captured and it feels like you are looking into the conversation of the two gentlemen on um, the bench and you feel like you are part of what they are experiencing. And, and I really love that. Every um, one of these sketchbooks feels like a little jewel box that you found of more wonderful things to explore. I also love that many of these studies that she was doing could be found on anything invitations to dinner parties, envelopes for the telephone company when bills came in. She was always drawing on something. And I love that, that she could not be sort of too far away from her sketchbooks or a piece of paper that a wonderful um, pair of legs kind of dangling over the top of a back of a piece of paper was something that she captured in that moment. And, when Polly was asked about um, the portraits that she did um, and the fact that she was so candid in how she was trying to capture what she saw, she said this, no, I don't flatter them. If one paints simply a pretty picture, why ask the subject to sit at all? I fight against that all the time. I put down the way I feel about them and I hope it is interesting. And I think you, if you look at these um, images, especially the, the facial expressions that she's capturing at different moments, even on this telephone envelope, um, you feel that. You can feel that she is kind of capturing a moment with them. Uh, and I really love that about uh, her archival pieces. But there's also something to her uh, with the natural themes. And this is, is one uh, topic that during the course of the exhibit and, and putting together the show, I really wanted to go into. So if you have the chance to come and see um, Near the Essence, you'll see a whole section on sort of her love of poetry and nature and where those things collide. Um, so I didn't want to repeat that necessarily here, but there is something to be said about um, this importance to her of understanding the world around her, um, the sense of going out. It wasn't just about people, it was about the landscape. And in this quotation that you see here that she said, you feel that you have succeeded if you have captured its essence, revealed its source in the ground of being. An object is transformed in the process. And so this really kind of close looking. Um, many of our friends were poets and fellow artists and also had this sense of kind of looking deeper and looking um, at what the essence was of an object around them. One of the things that she loved because she lived in Boston for part of the year was going out and sort of enjoying the Esplanade and the Commons. Uh, Polly suffered from um, sort of eye ailments uh, throughout her life and later lost her eyesight towards the end of her life, um, which was very difficult and she talked about it staggering and its sadness. Um, but from an early age, she was told that she should every half an hour close her eyes and sort of lay back and rest her eyes. And she talked about how much that she loved um, going out in Boston and she said this, um, I particularly loved painting on Esplanade in the public gardens where I could stretch out at full length on a bench on the grass where I covered my eyes. And so the sense of being in, in the sense of place. And when she talked about Boston, especially in the spring and the summer, she really loved those colors. We already heard her talk about that. This idea of spring was an explosion of color and away from the monotones. But she said to a friend, spending the summer in the city can be as heartbreakingly beautiful. Downy trees fluffing all over and furring the buildings, which are studded with jewelry, amethyst roofs and ruby chimney pots. Um, it's just so vibrant in what you can see. And uh, here's an image of her sort of sitting out in Boston, kind of working away. Um, and one of the things that I love in both this sketchbook and this um, completed artwork, you'll see these wonderful trees and the sense of kind of movement. I just want you to think about that. We'll kind of circle back around to this um, idea of branches. Um, but there is a sense of movement in everywhere that you look. Um, the little squirrel, the people on the bridge, um, the, the movement of the leaves and the trees. Um, it really was that she wanted to get out and sort of explore around her. Also, she loved going out and just taking walks. And uh, if you remember in the beginning when we were talking about the exploration stations at Fruitlands, 
That whole concept came from the quotation you see here, which was from Dinah, her daughter, uh, in talking about um, living with Polly. And, and this is Dinah talking her words. I remember taking walks with her, Polly, as a child. You know how children are supposed to be full of wonder? With us, the process was reversed. She was always delightfully drawing my attention to things that would never have been noticed otherwise. Um, I will share with you that over the course of working on this exhibit that these sorts of quotations uh, about Polly or of Polly's of getting out and exploring really had a profound impact on me. I made a point to go out during the uh, sort of stay at home order to get my exercise and taking the kids, um, you know, on the, the paths around um, where I live and looking a little closer, looking a little deeper at what I was seeing. And two of the pieces that you see here are some of my favorites uh, that Polly did in her sketchbooks. One of the doves, I just think it's beautiful um, in how you can sort of see she is even to the eye, like how to create the perfect eye and how to study this. And the bees are dancing and they're almost, you know, de-evolving and then coming back. And I love the sense of movement, but getting out there and just looking a little closer, even if it's in your backyard right now um, and seeing what can be explored, uh, I think is a real joy. And so again, this quotation was the basis for uh, the tour around uh, the campus, if you come and see it. In addition, she also explored animals, larger animals. Uh, Polly loved cows. If you know um, Polly and her love of River Farm, there are many beautiful sketches and watercolors of the cows that are there. But what you may not realize is that she did other sort of drawings that you see here on the top of the anatomy. Um, getting back to that idea that she wanted to sort of ex understand sort of the muscle structure, the bone structure, and sort of work up from there. That's of classic training, um, but that she, she would really think about it. And you can tell when you kind of compare the two, you can see where that is coming from. Um, these cows are so elegant, if you will, and graceful in how they're portrayed, but so realistic. And that comes from this idea of you know, where are the muscles? Um, and so these are, are um, plentiful. If you look through her archives, you can sort of see these uh, sort of sketches uh, as she explores the animals and how they look. I wanted to include uh, a, the picture of the lobster, which is in the lower corner. That's in the show. It's framed hanging on the wall over by the poetry section. And I want to share with you a wonderful story that Dinah shared her daughter uh, with a group of us when we were in the, the gallery. And she said, that her mother Polly had found this lobster when they were traveling in the Caribbean on vacation. And she kind of referred back to it several times over the course of their stay to kind of draw it and study it. And again, this idea of a naturalist eye, she was so exacting in her detail. And uh, when the family was coming back home uh, and they were at the airport, um, they were stopped because they had carcass of a lobster and Polly took out her sketchbooks to kind of show them that indeed, you know, this was sort of part of her, um, you know, profession and she was sort of studying it. And I just love that story because, you know, the sense of discovery that Polly continually had, she was a smart woman and thoughtful in what she was doing. And this, this intensity of understanding the smallest thing from uh, the way that a leg on an insect or on a lobster was articulated and you know, going down to that level of detail. I think it's really um, pretty remarkable. And I love seeing these small details sort of blown up. And it's great to be able to do this on a screen where you can really see the detail and fine work on these legs as an example. One of the most fun things for me of thinking about today's uh, presentation was the idea of flipping things around. I can't tell you how many times I would pull up something wonderful and you have to look at the other side because Polly was always flipping things over and using the other side of the piece of paper, which is a real conundrum for a curator to know which side you should use and display because sometimes the reverse was even more interesting. So if you've gone through the exhibit, you'll see on the left-hand side, on loan from the Smithsonian, this wonderful um, pair of uh, wings of an insect. 
and the detail is so amazing. You can, it's in a pullout drawer, you can kind of get close and look. But if you flip it over, there's a very lightly sort of half done, um, beautiful drawing of a, a dragonfly. And I love that. There's this sort of sense that um, there was a time element. I could just sort of see, right? If you're, even if you um, have had this example in a meeting, maybe not drawing as an artist, but you're feverishly into something, where's a piece of paper? You'll flip it over and you keep using it. Maybe it's for economy. Um, you don't wanna waste it. Maybe it's because one idea has sparked another and you want to quickly go. Or maybe it's just the urgency of wanting to continue on another path. I just love this about her work. So in the same way on the right hand side, um, we have a pair of shells that are on alternate sides of a piece of paper. Uh, and again, that that um, sort of interest is there. And I'm so glad to have this presentation tonight to be able to show you some of these examples. Um, when she talked about sort of sketching, not just painting, but sketching. She said this of drawing. She goes, drawing is the magic of the arts of the eye. The speed of the line makes so much difference. It is bliss, so direct and freer than the canvas. I love the swift, instantaneous movement and I'm completely absorbed in the expressing of what I want the work to say. And so when you think of that quotation and this idea of speed, and the bliss, I can just visualize Polly kind of flipping these over and using them in a different way. And here are two more examples, because again, I, I had, to, had to use them all. Um, I love this iris on the left, because on the flip side, she is practicing and trying out different ways to articulate um, the beautiful coloration on the iris. And it's just magical to see in person because it's watercolor and it just soaks into the page. And on the right hand side, this, if you look at sort of the conch shell and the beautiful edging of it, how interesting. And maybe she didn't think about this, but uh, on the, the lower picture, the sort of human form, the articulation of the back, it feels like sort of the edge, the shape of the edge of the shell. I'm not sure if she was after that or not, but that's where my eye went in looking at this. And I feel like a discovery to be able to find that on my own. I wanna talk a little bit about her use of color and shadows. And then admittedly in some of the next few images that we're gonna be looking at, some of them are just beautiful and there's not much to say. I just wanted to sort of share and inspire you with some of them. Uh, but she was always interested in shadows and light. And you'll see that and if you kind of compare some of the photos in the archives that we have, both of the trustees and um, down at the Smithsonian of her studio. And on the right-hand side, you'll see two photos of her studio at Wear River Farm. And what I love is that she's taken these photographs of the way that the shadows of the branches are on the building. And there were many more than the two that I, I'm showing you here. So if you think back to the images of her out on the esplanade and drawing these wonderful branches and the quality of life and the movement. Polly said, art is an expression of life and life cannot sit, sit still, even as something as simple as a branch without any leaves on it. And this idea of shading, many of the archives include little notations from lectures about shading. Um, daylight always is bluer than the, in the flesh. And um, she was really trying to get the idea of color correct. On the left-hand side, you'll see this study of a prism. And I knew that she had prisms on her desk from talking with uh, her, her friend and, and colleague, Dorothy. Um, a wonderful desk that we have in the exhibit was in her studio. And some of the things that were on the desk are there on display as well. So you get the sense of movement on her um, original desk. But this photograph that's inserted is of one of the prisms. And I just randomly sort of took a picture of it because I thought it was beautiful and then realized, my goodness, Polly have, has wonderful sketches of her sort of studying the light that was reflected, that refracted through it. And to have those two together, I think is just really magical and fun. And even as something as simple as an unfinished canvas um, of an 
a person or a statue, we're not really sure, it doesn't have a name or a date, but this idea of kind of color and pattern and texture, even on Polly's artist statement, she talks about sort of the communication through in the face of form and color pattern and texture in the boldest and subtlest. Um, so seeing something even just the brink of, of being worked on, um, you can see that coming through. One of my favorite pieces on loan from the Smithsonian is in the center. And what I loved is when I talked to them, when I saw it um, at the archive, we were looking at this and the archivist was like, oh, it looks, you know, like sort of move, like animals or, or some sort of thing. I thought it looked like people. Um, when we got the loan paperwork, it said they were calling them um, wings. But I love this, that she would sort of take and take apart lines and pieces and sort of bring them back together and experiment. And when you think about all of these three pieces, this idea of shadows, of contrasts, of black and white used in different ways, experimenting with those different ways, uh, I think you really see the sense of movement um, through even black and white. In this example of a series in this show of um, a Gates, on the left-hand side is a picture of Polly next to the gates that she's displaying in her artwork, just working away. And they're beautiful gates to be sure. I mean, if I was there, I'd take a picture of them myself. But to see her then move that and what she saw to something a little bit more complex, a little bit more mystical, if you will, um, and this idea of what is beyond. She talked about this quite a bit, um, sort of the visible and the invisible. What is just beyond what you can see and taking the form and kind of moving it. And I love the idea of the unfinished edges and the exhibit, a lot of what we have is not, is framed in ways that it's not covering the edges. On the right hand side, this very almost mystical taking layered pieces of paper, the gates, which are still recognizable, having almost a, a human form coming out. And one of my favorite quotations by Polly was when she was talking about ink blots. So, you know, this, the very standard kind of blotted ink and what do you see? She says of ink blots, almost everyone on being asked what they see in an ink blot will tell you an ink blot, but no one ever mentions the paper. And I just love that because in her artwork, you can see she's playing with that concept. She really wants to kind of dive deeper and not just see what's in front, but what's beyond. And in many of her florals on the left, um, unfinished thistle and irises, this sense of kind of going in and sort of seeing what's there. These very traditional forms that we all recognize instantly as florals and plants, but there's an infinite kind of mystical quality uh, to them and sort of what is beyond. And the thistles were something that she experimented with later in life and um, are really, I think, quite beautiful and stunning. And I love that this one is, is one that's not complete. Um, it's kind of looking in at that sort of moment of exploration. And a few of these next ones, honestly, I just included them to just let them just be soaked in. Uh, a white piece of paper that is given this sense of depth by her really remarkable and imaginative strokes. Um, this sort of look and the shadowing she did in florals, she did on uh, pieces that had um, sort of snow banks in Boston after big snowstorms like we just had. But something as simple has really been transformed in such eloquent ways, it's quite remarkable. And one of my other favorites in this show is a wonderful floral that you're looking in, you're looking beyond what is this iris, if you will, in the middle, this mystical quality, this sort of magical quality to her artwork. And this translates again, not only to the black and white, but then when she infuses the color in as well in this floral, it is pretty magical. And that leads us to um, sort of the last topic of sort of color and vibrancy. And what I love about some of these, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an artist. I wouldn't ever think to even start a piece of artwork halfway through up the page and just there, but this sense of sort of space that is used and not used and this vibrancy and these works that she had um, from going to Jamaica on several trips, just really bright and beautiful. She loved Mae Sarton. It was one of her favorite poets. She did a portrait of her that's at Harvard, but um, 
May said this, and what I loved in, in one of the um, handouts that she had, Polly sort of circled it. She really loved this. Books are well as, as food nourish and war people. Or excuse me, books make connections. Painters, poets are candles. And to me, I'm sure you can interpret this in different ways, but the sense of she's bringing this color and opening up a scene that I know I love going to the, the shore every summer in a way that I have never seen. Um, she really is, you know, my candle, if you will. To the extent that I've been able to enter into the secret of things and to convey things of this experience to others through my art, I'm deeply grateful. And it can be something as simple as, you know, a very sort of languid uh, stroke of a, a branch or a leaf on the ground. She's always looking at things in a new, bright, um, creative and bold way. And just to finish up um, this way, extended to new, new horizons. I love this aerial that she took uh, being in uh, an airplane and kind of looking down. It's really quite imaginative and uh, is out on our exploration trail. And just to finish, you know, if you do want to kind of join us, um, if you're sort of intrigued, as Catherine said, the uh, exhibit at Fruitlands will continue to be open on weekends through March. And then over at Lure River Farm, uh, we're very excited to be opening an outdoor experience there um, in a different way um, with some creative uses of the land to get out and explore. And Lure River Farm was one of Polly's you know, favorite places to always return to. She gave it to the trustees in 1999. Uh, it is still an operating farm and has camps and um, wonderful animals and hiking trails. And uh, really we're excited to invite people in to sort of see Polly's spirit of discovery. I also just noted a few things on here from the Smithsonian and um, you can go on and they have an audio of some of her um, conversations and um, uh, sort of interviews through the years so you can sort of hear her in your own words. But this has been a sort of a real joy to work on and thank you for coming along with me on this process. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and bring Catherine back. Well, um, but the, yeah, thank you for coming on the, the romp with me. I'm just, it, like I said in the beginning, it's so exciting to be able to share things that I feel like I discovered, but they didn't quite fit into the narrative of the show. Mm -hmm. So to be able to bring some life to them with you tonight uh, is a real thrill. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, so, we do have uh, time for question and answer. So if anyone has any questions you wanna stick in that Q&A function, please feel free to send those along and we'd be happy to add them into our conversation. Um, I have one question I'd love to kind of start with, which I'm really struck in that presentation in a way that I hadn't really thought about previously, despite knowing many of these things about Polly already, um, is kind of that dueling love of both the city and the rural between her time in Boston and her time in Hingham. And I'm wondering if either she had written anything about this or if you noticed anything in her work that shows any sort of kind of distinct reactions to how she responds to her surroundings when she's urban versus rural. You know, we're, we're really fortunate. She was such a prolific writer. Um, she was so smart and she's, to me, puts things into words that I, I can't even imagine. She's so poetic and we are very fortunate to have her reflections of being at Where River Farm as a child. And she talks about sort of coming from the Fenway area and, and you know, coming out um, and talked about it sort of as an idyllic and sort of um, kind of a more relaxed way of living. And I think, you know, at the time when you, when you put it into context, she was in that Boston circle, you know, there was, it was more formal in the city. And so coming um, down to Hingham, she could ride cows. Um, she could run barefoot, which she talks about down the hill after breakfast. And if you missed, you know, dinner, there was no dinner then, so you better be on time. And, and these, this sort of real enchantment um, with it. And I think, again, I, I don't wanna put words into her mouth, but I, I see that sense of discovery so early on as something that she locked onto and kept with her. 
And no doubt those were really instrumental moments for her career throughout. Um, I'm sure the Boston side of her, you know, she loved the vibrancy of the city and city life and seeing people and was so involved in different charities and communities and um, friends and neighbors in the city. So it is sort of a nice contrast to see, um, you know, both of those. Um, and so you do see a little bit of, of difference um, in what she's sort of studying and doing. And there's notebooks upon notebooks of her time in Boston and then her time in, you know, out somewhere else traveling or down in Hingham. But um, it was fun to sort of see both and I can see where she locked into it. And, um, you know, it, to me, this really going into the archives is about something that's unfinished. And I love that quality to so many of these pieces tonight and others that I saw. And it just shows to me how smart and thoughtful she was as, as an artist, because to still give you that sort of emotional response in something that is unfinished and quickly done, I think is a, a, a real talent. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Jeffrey who asks, are there any interviews on audio or video to hear her passion? Yes, so the two, and um, maybe Catherine, we can, um, uh, let me, the la that last slide I had, um, I had two different things and I could bring that. Put that slide back up. Yeah, here, let me just, hang on everybody. Come back up, okay. Can you see that? Uh, yes. Great. So down at the bottom, the listen to her words. And this is something on sort of public radio, if you write down that website, and let me tell you the context. This is amazing. So she found a boa constrictor snake in the commons and took it home with her and put it in her foyer and wasn't sure if it was dead or not, but wanted to see it thaw and, and see what, you know, what it was. And eventually she realized that it was dead and um, contacted Harvard because she wanted to sort of learn more about it. And that in of itself is remarkable because it's really her sort of artistic ex exploration approach and sort of a naturalist all coming together. But to hear her tell this story in this interview um, in such a nonchalant, it's very casual, and I just love hearing her voice. I think I may have shared that with you, Catherine, early on. I in the, that one. Um, but I, that's why I wanted to include because I can't tell the story. I can't do it justice, but. Um, that is really a remarkable thing and reached out to the interviewer and he said it was fine to share that and um, sort of include it. So um, I urge you to, to listen to her. And then if you do go to the Smithsonian archives, you have to kind of look around, but on the main page for Polly, when you put in Polly Thayer Star and her collection will come up, there's actually, if you scroll through the different pictures they have as an example, there's a link to hear part of an interview um, that is transcribed from 1995. And it's a really long interview. I refer to it many times. And just to hear again, she's such, um, she speaks with such a, a poise and thoughtfulness and every word is very carefully taken and thought about, but uh, she really invites you in. So I, that's the reason exactly. So thank you for uh, Jeffrey for your question. I wanted to include that because um, I love listening to her voice and I hope you do too. I, I, I find that despite having heard it before, you've teased my curiosity enough that um, if you wanna stop sharing your screen for a second, yeah. I can share my computer audio and play a little bit oh, of that'd that. Be great. I won't play the whole thing, but just to give a little, little right. taste of it. So one second here, folks. I love this technology at work, this is great. Look at these things we can do these days. All right. Vicki and I, we were out alone and saw this strange creature on the ice of the lagoon in back of our house. And uh, I was curious about it and found it was an enormous snake. Policeman went by and I said, do you see what I see out there? And he said, yes. And I said, well, can I have it? 
シャレじゃあれは<笑> I think that's, that's a perfect clip perfect absolutely I, when you describe that she takes this home with her I mean what a reaction to have to finding that and also how on earth did a boa constrictor end up Oh, well, there, if you listen through it, there's, there's a little bit at the end that it was possibly part of an act in town, like a, not a circus per se, I can't find the right word, but yes, it had sort of this weird connection. And I recently found a picture of her holding the snake. And then, I mean, it's a long snake and she has this fearless quality to her and this idea, you know, she just goes out and And she's excited by it and she's interested in, and there's no fear. I'm honestly, I'm not sure I'd bring a boa constrictor home. I think I'd be like, oh, I can't do that. And nope, she, she was sort of fearless、um, in this wonderful intensity. And yeah, so if you have the chance to listen to the whole thing, I think it's, it's really great. And,、um, you know, and nothing is sort of wasted. You know, she's always looking and, and finding the best and the most interesting things in anything around her, even a snake. That、uh, hearing that audio and hearing her voice really does bring her to life in a whole nother way. It's such a、um, you know, particular、uh, approach to language and to,、um, to her Bostonian upbringing in her、yeah. voice. And I imagine with all the time that you spent going through her archive and reading her words and listening to her words and talking to those who knew her. You must feel like you have your own relationship with her. And I am curious if you could meet her in some capacity, which we know is not possible, but if you could, what would you want to ask her? That is a great question, Catherine.、Um, well, I think I, you know, I, I went into this already admiring her art. I think I was surprised to discover how strong of a woman she was. And I think, you know, as a working mom, someone dealing with COVID, as we all are, you know, that, that moment of, of sort of really finding out more about her as a, like seeing her as a strong woman, I think I would kind of ask her about, you know, being a female artist at a time when, you know, it was more male dominated. World.、Um, one of the other favorite things from the Smithsonian in the exhibit is you know, this wonderful little、um, newspaper clipping where it says Boston Man you know, wins、um, this award. It's actually her. They said Boston Man. And you know, a friend kind of is sending her a note with a little Laurel Branch、uh, female artist as well, saying, like, ah,、oh, the stupidity. And、um, you know, I kind of want to know a little bit about that. And The moment that she's an artist and kind of emerging, that must have been a little extra tough. You know, she, in her own right, went through all of the rigors of a very strong、um, formal education as an artist and kind of emerging from that, I'm sure, had its challenges. And so I'd like to know a little bit about th- that. And I think, you know, the idea of the poetry to me was so unexpected. Um, I guess I should have known because if you know, when you do a survey of her work, as you come into something like this, you know, there were a lot of、um, correspondence and poetry,、uh, painter,、uh, paintings of poets and such. But to really see how much she took it in and was so personal. And I think I'd ask her about that and her process of poetry and art and where they kind of intersected. I think it's something that I was trying to tease out in the. Exhibition, but、um, it's really great. Like, I i like, you know, May Sarton is one of my favorites, and、um, others that she loved are ones that I love. And so I'm kind of curious just to know a little bit about that.、Um, so, yeah, I, it would be great. I, I would definitely、um, love to have tea with her. And I have to tell you, Catherine, I may have shared this with you, but last year when we were starting this and we we're at the stay at home and kids are homeschooled and、um, the kids had to pick someone that they wish they could have tea with、um, or you know, meet,、um, of course, all the other kids picked like Marvel superheroes and my daughter picked Polly. And I got to tell you, it was like the most proud moment ever.、Um, and I've shared that story 
um, widely because I love that she is someone that a nine-year-old or someone, <laughs> you know, in the art field and um, curatorial field would want to meet as well. And there's a lot that we can kind of take from her. Oh, that's beautiful. That's such a beautiful legacy too of ongoing influence. It, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's sort of this project is one that keeps on giving back, and it's fun to now start to change gears and talk about where River Farm and um, you know that'll be a fun challenge because there's not a gallery there, and sort of it's an outdoor experience, and we really want people to kind of get out and explore, and find. Um, her art and a little bit of whimsy along the way. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that. But that, I think that'll, um, more questions will come up. And I think more questions I'd love to ask Polly will come up as we start working on that. So I have one uh, final question for you. Um, and that's really, I of course, many artists who are gonna, who have long careers go through various stages in those careers that um, you know, Picasso has his blue period, you know, that type of thing. In the, certainly I think that's reflected in her work and how it's displayed in the gallery that she did have those different um, focuses at different times, but did you notice anything about her sketches and her archives that really showed an arc of change over the course of her career and of her life? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think certainly in the beginning, you know, and I wasn't necessarily looking at everything in a chronological way um, in the, how it was grouped in the archives. So I was definitely um, kind of happening upon them maybe out of order at times. I did think about that in terms of how to lay out the exhibit because um, there is a little bit of an arc. You know, it's, it's so very, traditional and you know, measured and you know you can see as you stumble upon each period that she has a mentorship the words that she talks about that and then artwork from that moment and so there is a really nice continuity to that kind of taking it in you know but even early on she's she sort of always has notebooks and so that's sort of on the side she she was always drawing something as I said um, and I did think about that, is that like a timeline, a better way to approach this or not? And I think in the end, I decided that I really wanted to tease out some themes. Um, but I think as she, she you know, went on in her career, um, the boldness grew or the, you know, exploration grew. Um, I did try to show that a little bit with the three, there are three portraits one from the Boston Athenaeum, which we showed in the beginning, um, one from much later, um, which is sort of in a shadowy sort of gaze, and one is much earlier, which is sort of very academic. And I think through those three and then the text that I wrote for the exhibit, using those at least of sort of a model of here's a self-portrait during a time of like academic training. Here's one where this boldness is starting to come up. She's doing natural themes and has this like she's locked eyes on you. And then one where it's it feels much more ethereal. Um, so I think in some ways you can almost see it in the portraits themselves. And so that's very subtle, maybe too subtle in the exhibit, but at least I wanted these three to kind of look at each other in the middle of the room. And so people can kind of see, although I will say they're all very strong. I mean, they, they show fierce, in an awesome sense of the word, like a very fierce and strong woman, um, even though they're created in different techniques. Absolutely. Oh, those three portraits are so different from each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And you even working on the catalog, we decided to like pull those out, have their sort of own section for them to really just give them some breathing room um, because they're really when, you, when we finally got those in the room together, you know, one had to travel from the Boston Athenaeum, which I'm eternally grateful for during a pandemic, you know, getting them all in the same space and they're all kind of looking at each other. I'm like, that, that's where we want to go, so. Well, unless anybody else in the audience has any final questions they want to quickly jot into the chat box, I think that we can, uh, we can close with that and um, that, image of Polly. Um, 
I want to thank you so much, Christy, for uh, speaking here for our audiences today. Uh, I did want to let everybody know who's here. We have been um, recording this conversation. I know some of you had to hop in a little ways into the presentation. Um, so I would be happy to follow up tomorrow with a, uh, access to the recording if you wanted to go back and watch anything you had missed um, or check anything out closer. Um, so that will be made available to you as well. Um, thanks so much everyone for attending and supporting our program and we hope to see you out at Fruitlands and Weir River Farm in the coming year. Um, okay. So thank you, Christy, and thank you. Oh, we've got a question. Oh. <laughs> do you know who helped Polly get married in Italy? I do. Um, yes, very quickly. It's uh, Rose Nichols, and I just um, recently gave a talk to the Nichols house. But um, yes, very quickly, Polly surrounded herself with equally strong and wonderful women. And um, when Polly was over there, um, she, they realized her and Donald realized that they, it was not as easy to get married as they thought. And so they had Rose step in as a friend to kind of help sort the situation out in this wonderful way. But um, yeah, it was, it's sort of a great story. So, and I, you know, there's a little bit on the Nichols House website about that. And you can see a portrait that she, Polly later did of, of Rose as well as part of the collection there. It's this, this wonderful network of, um, you know, a web of people, so to speak, so. Awesome. Thank you for that quick question there, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Bye. thanks again, everybody. Have a great evening. Thanks. Bye.